So we want to say a special thank you to our musicians and our praise team for leading us out in that special music there. Amen. 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 Sometimes to participate in the special music is also important. It's also a good thing. Amen. 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 Pass me not, O gentle Savior, the poet said. Hear my humble cry, while in others thou art calling, do not pass me by. So, so we give God thanks for that, and we will continue to keep Brother Rodius in our prayers, and we trust that God would bring him safely through uh, the challenges of health that he encounters right now. I want to invite us to join me in, to join us, our church family. Um, we had last year a day of prayer and fasting set for Wednesday every week. And I want to ask us to join again in that uh, day of prayer for our church family and for the programs that we work in with as a church. Now I have said repeatedly um, and, and I know everyone who has heard me talking about this recognize that if for any reason you cannot fast through the day, that's okay. You probably can join us in the praying. So that's what we want to invite us all to join in. Um, so I just, I just want to invite us to participate in that. The first... Um, outreach program for the summer is going to be there in on August the 23rd and so we want to make that community outreach that community guest day a, a special thing of prayer also and we'll work and pray together in terms of inviting people for the day and to encourage ourselves to be ready for that day. But we put in that before the Lord uh, also as we go through. So that day, please um, pencil in your, or, or pen into your schedules, or put it into your PDAs, or whatever thing you use to, um, to keep your schedule, your Google Calendar, whatever. Please put that in there. And those of you who are listening online, please do the same and join us here at church on Sabbath day uh, for that special day. Okay. The passage of scripture was read from the New International Version. I'm going a few more weeks with the New King James Version, then I'm going to switch out. Um, so because you probably haven't had time yet to change your versions probably. Just follow me as we read a little bit of the passage that was read. And I call the thing for the day an indispensable gift for a needy friend. An indispensable gift for a needy friend. And it may just be that God has been guiding in what we're doing today, and you'll see the connections in everything that has happened thus far from our Sabbath school right on to now. You will notice that connection, and, um, and we will try to keep that at going. He said to him, to them, excuse me, which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. Nothing to set before him. Nothing. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence. The old word in the old version was because of his importunity. 
old English word, importunity. He will rise and give him as many as he needs. An indispensable gift for a needy friend, O oh God of heaven. We thank you so much for manifesting yourself here in our place of worship today. And we trust also in the lives of the saints who are following us online. We thank you. As we reflect on your word, this parable spoken by our Lord, I pray that you would participate with us and Teach us some new thing. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. There have been times in our lives, I'm sure, When guests came over unexpectedly and we had to struggle to get something together to serve them. Maybe, maybe it has happened to my family on more than one occasion. So there is something about this that we can identify with. Nobody wants to be in a situation with nothing to serve a friend who suddenly visits. In this parable, we can let our minds return to the place of New Testament happenings, the culture of the day. A man and his children typically slept in the same space. And the houses were built, the architectural technology of the day made it so that when people went to bed, they locked themselves in from the inside. And sometimes, in some settings, it was a contraption which required some work. And so it is not unusual for someone to want to stay inside until the breaking of day because it took a little more work than usual to lock himself and family in. And so this, this story fits that understanding. And in the heat of the season sometimes, traveling was really at night. And because traveling was really at night, it is not improbable for a traveler to arrive at somebody's house during the night. This here says in the Greek, the meso, mesonuktion, the middle of night. It was not unreasonable for that to happen. So that's what happened on this occasion. Somebody came and arrived at midnight. And so the friend, it's not unusual also for somebody to be without bread because very often the, the budget for bread was bread enough for one day. They'll bake in the community and sometimes the family may not have more bread than for the day in question. So it's not unusual for a person to not have bread during the night. He'll bake tomorrow. But also it is not unusual for somebody to know who has bread. Because they baked in such a way that within the community, generally people would know, well, Horatius doesn't have bread, but the Smiths have bread. So they'll go across and ask the Smiths for bread because in the community it was known who had and who didn't have. Also, it was not unusual for an individual to feel if he or she is called and asked uh, to give bread, 
the person would generally recognize yeah this is a part of my responsibility because the guest that came by was usually perceived as the community's guest and not just the person's guest so when the person was getting ready to leave usually the person in whose house the guests stayed would usually say thank you for blessing our village with your presence not thank you for blessing me with your presence but thank you for blessing our village the guest was understood to belong to the community are you still with me so that's how this story develops and so jesus tells the story that the host had no bread that's not necessarily implying a sense of poverty, a sign of poverty. Bread for the day was baked every morning. And so the story starts out, I think the story starts out, and the story says there in verse 5, it says there, the friend came at midnight, and he went across to the neighbor and said, to another friend and said, come, give me some bread. He said, lend me three loaves because somebody came to visit and I have nothing to give. The parable, I think, is illustrative of that part of the parable, I think, is illustrative of every person who calls himself Christian and is involved in God's work. What is illustrative? Stay with me. In this logical theme, every one of us can identify with somebody with nothing to give. Nothing to give. That is the logical theme of every Christian worker in the world. Of our own selves, we have nothing. Am I making myself clear? Of our own selves, we have nothing. I have nothing to give to set before him. Nothing to serve the visitor is the logical theme of every Christian worker in the work of service. In this world of service, each of us needs to start to conceptualize ourselves as having nothing. Why? Because everything is in somebody else. Every morning, Upon our rising up, we have nothing to give. Nothing to give for the day is a logical theme. God delights in bestowing benefits upon people. And we can identify with this friend who had somebody, this, this, this host, who had a guest stop by and had nothing to give. Churches sometimes do not recognize the reality of this. Christians sometimes do not recognize this reality and we sometimes pride ourselves into thinking that we have to give. No, the Bible is saying here, I think by analogy, that we have nothing to give. Churches, if we do not understand where we stand and how we should be standing with God, we could be calling ourselves churches, but in fact we have nothing to give. It's a certain realization that we need to come by. The farmer, and so, and so, and so, he turns to somebody to look for help. The Pablo is introducing us to the true nature of prayer, I think. When an individual gets down to praying, we can, we can just linger a little bit on that. When an individual gets down to praying, the nothing to give makes us now turn to a certain reality, a certain practice which Christians should be engaged in, and that is the act of prayer. When an individual gets down to praying, what should happen? What do we expect to happen? I am suggesting here that first there is something that needs to happen to the person's mind who is engaged in the prayer. There is something. There is an elevation of the mind. There's a purifying effect of prayer. Prayer has an impact on the mind. Some 
are more interested in getting answers to their prayers than they are interested in engaging in the act of praying and talking to God. So I'm saying that prayer for us needs to do something to the person. The person, remember, now has nothing to give. So we go to talk to God. We are not just talking to God to get an answer for what we think we need. The talking to God is an engagement in a relationship with someone and that conversation is also about what God is going to do to the mind of the praying person. Are you with me still? Sometimes prayer expresses the yearning to know what is God's will for my life. So that I can orient my life, I can have God orient my life to put it in accordance with his will, praying. It's not just about getting the thing that I'm looking for. It's about the orientation of my life. Prayer seeks to release God's will and to reveal God's will to me so that I can appreciate that will with childlike trust. Prayer. And so beyond these realities of what prayer is supposed to be, so prayer is supposed to do these things. It's supposed to have a sanctifying, elevating impact on the mind of the praying saint. That's what prayer is supposed to do. It's supposed to orient the will to God. Prayer. Prayer is supposed to help me understand what is God's will for my life. Prayer is supposed to help me seek to have my life by the power of God be aligned with the will of God. Prayer. Prayer. But you see, there's an, there's an additional way to look at this. When a farmer goes out to work the field, to labor, He's not doing the labor just for the physical exercise. You with me? He's not there just to build muscle. He's not there just to get buff. A farmer is not doing the work just for that. So this transformation of the mind is not all that prayer is about. Are you still with me? Beyond being out there in the rain, in the sun, working through, the farmer is looking for something to grow. He expects an actual crop. He goes out and he's looking to see first the blade, then the air, then the full cord in the air. So it is with prayer. If the arrow of prayer is to hit heaven, when we must, we must shoot it with a soul that is fully connected to God. God and with that connection that earnestness that prayer reaches we have nothing in the house is what this probably said nothing in the house I have nothing to give of my own self Jesus said to us of your own selves you can do nothing and I'm struggling here to say that the Christian needs to understand himself or herself as individuals with no capacity to do anything for anybody left alone. The story of this host who had the guest come in is the story of every Christian's life who has committed himself or herself doing work for the Lord. It's that understanding of my own self. I have nothing. And so the guests came. While at Andrews University some years ago, one Sabbath day we knew some relatives were going to come into town from a, from a neighboring uh, city there in Michigan. And we, my wife prepared. We students. So after church we told the folks, come over for lunch. Sabbath lunch. Now, they're thinking, it's a university campus. These people are poor. And they didn't want to come, so they left. They said, okay, we're going to be there. And then they left. 
and then my wife is pretty resourceful at these things so indeed we were poor students you know I don't know we're always we've always been poor so the poor is not just about the students part you know just poor and she so she had a good something prepared and we waited and they didn't show later on they called and then they came over they said well we know you all invited us but we weren't we weren't certain you all had anything to offer us we didn't want we wanted to save you the embarrassment well we had something to give this man's story says he didn't have and so he went to the friend who he knew had and that's my second point of the day if the story is letting us know that of our own selves we have nothing Every Christian worker needs to have that realization. But secondly, the story says, the story says, this, this, this friend that he's going to is a representative of God. According to the parable, the friend that he goes to is a representative of God. Why did he go to the friend? Because he knew that this friend had everything he needed. And so, this story tells us, that though we have nothing, we have a God to whom we can go. We go to him because God has everything. And he is able to give us everything that we need. Importunity is the word used there. He goes there, the story says. So I'm saying secondly, the story is saying to us, though you have nothing as a Christian, that is not a lost state there is a God who has everything and we can go to God who has everything because he is able to give us all that we need that's where the prayer starts to form itself in a meaningful way and so he said he goes there and he calls he calls from the outside and the friend says what's the matter he says well, I have somebody who just came by to visit. Just arrived at midnight. And I need some bread. He said, lend me three loaves. And the friend said, man, listen, I'm in already. Don't bother us. And Jesus said, according to the parable, but he doesn't leave. He uses the word that is translated persistence. That's translated importunity. The word literally means, I'm going to tell you what the word literally means. It comes from the Greek anandia. It means, it's used, this is the only place this particular word is used in the New Testament. It literally means a total disregard for domestic decency. In attention to the neighbor's privacy and comfort, it refers to a persistence. A behavior that has a shamelessness in its persistence. Are you with me? Importunity. It is shameless persistence. That's what it is. It is a persistence that continues. Even though there have been insults hurled at the one making the request. It is a time of, type of behavior that continues even though somebody is insulting you that's what this is that's the word jesus uses we're gonna get to god's response later on but this passage is saying this story is saying now we have nothing so we go to god prayer is the work of importunity that's what it is saying to us According to this passage, this shamelessness is the same kind of attitude, that behavior that Abraham had in Old Testament times. In Genesis chapter 18, we are told that Abraham went out there and he begged God. He was interceding on behalf of the, of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. It is that kind of shameless persistence. He says, what about if there are 50 women? 
will you save this city? How about 45? How about 40? That shameless persistence. He, Abraham, is interceding to God on behalf of individuals in whose faces apparently the door of mercy has already been shut and he's begging God for mercy for them. That's importunity. Importunity, somebody else said as I read this, work this week, is like the woman, the Syrophoenician woman. In Matthew chapter 15 that came to Jesus begging for him to intervene and help his daughter. It is that shameless persistence. What happens there according to the story? The lady came and she said, Lord, have mercy on my daughter. Because she is, she is, she, he, she starts shouting at him, the Bible says, Lord, have mercy on my daughter because she is tormented by a demon. She begs him. The Bible says he walks away. He walks away. He ignores her, but she presses on. He walks away from her, but she follows and begs. His disciples turned to him and said, his disciples now turned to him and said, now why, why don't you just chase her away from us? He doesn't answer them. She hears them obviously and she continues to beg. And then the Bible says she goes before him. She got down on her knees and she said, Lord, my daughter is sick. A demon has been tormented her. Help me. And Jesus now turns to her and he hurls apparently the ultimate insult. He says, must I? He said, first of all, I've been sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she continues to beg. And then he hurls what apparently is the ultimate insult. He says, must I take the children's bread and give to the dogs? Are you with me? And she turns to him and she said, Lord, even the dogs eat the food from that falls from the master's table. Importunity continues and Jesus made the point to his disciples. He said, that's what I wanted you all to see. Such faith. Such faith. And he sent her away. Importunity broke through. It broke through eventually. Glory to God. This persistence had a breakthrough point. Stay with me, please. I'm speaking of importunity as if it is a person. I'm speaking about importunity, this persistence, as if it is the name of somebody, as if my name is there or your name is there. I'm speaking as if any of us can put our names there. Importunity prays when it feels the need. Importunity does not put off the praying. Importunity is stole. Wait until the morning, it says. He cannot wait until the morning. He goes at midnight and continues to beg. Importunity works at an inconvenient time for the person locked in with the supplies, has that he can give, and the needy friend next door has just come in. He is famished. He needs something to eat. And importunity stays with this intercession until it gets the breakthrough. And Jesus said, this friend would not respond because of the friendship, but because of the persistence. And so there's a breakthrough. The point I'm making is we have nothing to set before the visitors. That is the logical theme of every Christian worker in the world of service. Importunity knows it has nothing to give. And it turns to God because God has everything. And he or she Wants something from God. Importunity is a state of restless, shameless, desperate need.
stays with God. Importunity makes repeated annoying requests and demands. And so the story goes. The story goes. Importunity has multiple ways. This passage shows me a few things. It says here, first of all, and this brings me importunity. This persistence has multiple operational dimensions, so to speak. It displays simple but powerful behaviors which endear it to God. Importunity, persistence displays certain operational behaviors which endears it to God. What are those behaviors? First of all, it says here, he will not be put off. Importunity will not be put off. It goes and stays in to hear in God's ear to receive from God. It keeps on calling. It calls until heaven answers. And then it continues even though it is rebuffed. It continues. It realizes it cannot afford to wait until the morning. It perseveres. Importunity said, friend, let me have free load will not be put off. Importunity is specific. The prayer of the saint will not wait, but it's also specific. He does not ask for all the world. He doesn't ask for the global community. He makes comprehensive requests for the person in need at this time. It is specific. He says, friend, the friend said, what do you want? He said, I need three loads. Three loaves. Why do you need three loaves? Because a friend has come by and I need to have something to give him. Importunity is not going to be put off. Importunity is specific. The prayer of the saint will not wait. The prayer of the saint is specific. Importunity, the Bible says, he stood at the door where he could be heard. He stands at the door. This is language that suggests that he's speaking at a place where he knows the owner of the house can hear him or her. And so we understand God hears. There is a place in Revelation when he said, I stand at the door and knock. The figurative language is somewhat reflective of what's happening here. This man stands at the door. God is right there at the door. He's waiting to open to give us what we need. Importunity will not be put off. It is specific. It stands where it can be heard. Every saint who goes down on his or her knees knows that God's ear is tuned into him or her. Importunity, this persistence, asks for enough and extra to spare. He fixes an amount. He says, I need three loaves. Three loaves. One writer says he asks one for himself, one for the friend, and one to spare. He asks for extra. Importunity is expectant. It believes that there is going to be a response. So importunity will not be put off. It is specific. It stands where he can be heard. Every saint who goes down on his knees, God hears. And he speaks, importunity speaks, and asks for enough and extra. Importunity is expectant. Expectant. I read this week of a little girl whose mother had been praying years for her husband, her father, the child's father, mother's husband, to become a Christian, almost to no avail. And one night, one evening as they were there, mom was waiting and the little girl turned to her and she said, mommy, I've prayed. When daddy comes home tonight, he's going to be a Christian. She'd listened to her mother pray this prayer all along. And she had gotten to the stage where she started praying the prayer. And in her simplicity, she had developed enough faith. And she had expectations. 
expectation that God was going to answer her prayer. So she turned to her mother and said, he's going to come home tonight, a Christian. And they waited and waited. And then the girl went to sleep. She said, mommy, it's time to go to sleep. He's going to come home a Christian. And she went to bed. Her mother, mother went to bed and she, and she waited. And in bed at, just after midnight, her husband came home. And the story said when he came in, he walked over to her, went to her bed and said, you know what? I think I found Christ for myself. By this time, the little girl was fast asleep and the both of them went across to her bed and they stood there. And the little child in her childlike simple faith, she opened her eyes and before they could say anything, she looked up and she said, mommy, I told you, did he not come home a Christian? Importunity expects, expects. And eventually this, this persistence prevailed. All true prayer, all true prayer is answered. All the prayers of the saints are answered. The Bible has but one teaching on the subject of prayer and that is the effectual fervent prayer of righteous people are answered i was sitting in the tent one day and an old evangelist is now deceased he told a story he told the story of a lady who was singing in the train back in the days when the train had the conductors who would pass through and check to see if the person had the ticket and she said, this lady, he told the story, he said, this lady was singing in the train. And they got to one of the play stations and it was dead winter. Dead winter. And he said, the conductor came to this lady and asked for her ticket and she couldn't find a ticket. She didn't have a ticket. And he told her, you got to get out the train. Dead of winter. And people, they're looking out. Some people started begging him, let the lady stay in the train in here. She was singing her Christian songs of Jesus and he put her out the train. Shouted his usual shout all aboard and he waved to the engineer to continue going and they couldn't move. The train couldn't move. Couldn't move. And the, 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 the guy told the story, he said, he said, one of the people in the train turned to the conductor and said, Man, that lady's angel has her his has his foot on the brake. This train is not going anywhere. Let the lady back in. Opened up and he let her back in. Waved. And the train started moving again. Prayer always breaks through. Prayer for the lady broke through. So I noted her importunity. This persistent has persistence has behavioral dimensions that endears it to God. It cannot be put off. It is specific. It asks for enough and extra to spare. It stands where it can be heard. It is expectant. It is expecting something to happen when he or she calls upon God. Importunity, importunity prevails. It prevails. And so the story, the parable is suggesting that as Christians, none of us has anything of ourselves to give. We are empty. It is the logical theme of every Christian worker in the world of service. Importunity goes to God because God has everything. And she wants something from God. It's a state of restless, shameless, and desperate need. Importunity has multiple operational dimensions. It sim displays simple behaviors. Powerful, simple behaviors that endears it to God. And so the Bible says, so, he says here, I say to you, I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, he will 
because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Three loaves. He will rise and give him as many as he needs. Jesus says that. And so this brings me to the point. He's making the point about God now. And this is the fourth thing I want to say. The second last thing Jesus said. What Jesus is saying, I think, is saying here, as good as, he says, so then. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for a bread from a father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Or if instead of a fish, or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then be an evil. That's how he says it. If you then be an evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more is your heavenly father willing to give? So that's, that's how it comes together now. He makes the point by contrast. And so everything depends on the goodness of God. And so my fourth observation here is as good as you can imagine a friend's response could be. Our loving God's behaviors, our loving God's responses are infinitely superior. So no matter what kind of friend you have, he's, I'm saying, this Bible is just saying, no matter how good a friend we think we have, we can call upon God's behavior, God's loving responses are infinitely superior. Everything depends on the goodness of God, not on the unrelenting determination of the begging person. That's not what the answer is all about. He's making the point by contrast. God is eager to answer. God is eager to be found. God is eager and ready to open the door every time. It is the faithfulness of God that matters, not the persistence of the praying person. It is the goodness of God. So he comes down here and he uses the illustration. He says, which number of you, if a father's child asks him for bread, would give him a stone? If a child asks the father for, 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 for food, would he give him a a serpent or if he, he asks him for an egg would he give him a scorpion fathers do not behave like that and so whether it's bread whether it's fish or whether it is egg whatever the food the child asks for the story presupposes relationship the relationship between God and the person is the relationship between the child and the father. That's what he's talking about. And based on that relationship, God answers. So the story is not setting out to talk about how somebody must, must be on his or her knees begging God to respond to a genuine need after a person has allowed himself or herself to be oriented to the will of God and is talking to God in accordance with the will of God. That's not what the story is. The story is about talking about the goodness of God. And the goodness of God means that as good as any friend might be, our friends are evil. We are evil if it's being evil beings. You know how to give good gifts. Think about the infinite goodness of God and how he responds. And so the story tells us. And so I close the story. And the story today is that we have nothing to set before others. We are empty. Of our own selves, we are empty. Importunity, that persistence, we go to God. Because God has everything that we need. And he is willing to give us. That importunity is a state of restless, shameless, desperate need. We go to God and he answers. The story says that importunity has multiple dimensions. 
These behaviors and dearest to God, the being specific, they will not be put off. The stand where he can hear us. The calling upon him with that expectation that he's going to respond. And the expectation results in the breakthrough. God is there with us. That's the kind of thing. And this story is saying to us that our God is a good God. He's a loving God. He's a God of goodness. And he's eager to answer us. Not because we have been crying to him in a long drawn out way. No, it's because he is good and we come to him in need. That's what the story is. And so, when you see, you read the parables and you see the, this is the link word. Verse 9 says, so I say to you, that's what the old Bible interpreters of parable call the tertium comparationis in the Latin. It's the point of the story, the point of comparison. So I say to you, he says, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. He tells them, which them of you, your son ask you for bread, you will give him a stone. Which father among you shall ask for fish, will give him a serpent. Or ask for an egg, boiled egg, will go and give him a scorpion. Who would do that? Nobody would. The way he frames the question, the author, is the, the, the writers are suggesting, he frames the question expecting a negative answer. No, he wouldn't do that. So the story ends. Here's where it gets messy, but in a positive way. This story is not about God answering certain types of prayers. The story, he says, which now of you, after you do this thing, if you then been evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father Give the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? The story has never been about the needs that I want to go to talk to God about. This story is, is about the need for the Holy Spirit. This parable is about the need of the Holy Spirit. So the fifth observation, importunity, this persistence, is requesting the Holy Spirit. And when we request the Holy Spirit, of all the things that we can pray for, there is nothing God is more eager to give to us than the Holy Spirit. Are you hearing me? The story today, we may be eager to pray for money, we may be eager to pray for God to pay the mortgage. We are eager to pray for healing, health, conversion of our children. But sometimes not enough for the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying to us here, what he is talking about in this parable is about the need of the person and the church for the Holy Spirit. That's what the story is about. Ellen White helped me through this. She said, when men take themselves, work with me, please. We're almost done, but I just have to get this in. When men take themselves, she says in the book, Steps to Christ, page 101. When men take themselves out of social life, away from Christian duty and cross-bearing, when they cease to work earnestly for the master who worked earnestly for them, they lose the subject matter of prayer and have no incentive to devotion. Their prayers become personal and selfish. They cannot pray in regard to the wants of humanity for the building of God's kingdom. Pleading for strength wherewith to work. Are you all with me? It is my considered opinion that many people who refer to themselves as Christians have removed themselves from the work of God. 
she's saying, not engaged in the sphere of Christian duty. And all they can do is pray for selfish things. They have lost the desire to pray on this one subject matter for the Holy Spirit. That's what she's saying. We sustain a loss when we neglect the privilege of associating together to strengthen and encourage one another in the service of God, the truths of his word lose their vividness and importance in our minds. Our hearts cease to be enlightened and aroused by their sanctifying influence and we decline in spirituality. In our association as Christians, we lose much by lack of sympathy with one another. He who shuts himself up to himself is not fulfilling the position God designed that he should. And so that's really what we have. Jo John talks about God sending us the Holy Spirit. As Jesus spoke, he records that I'm going to talk a little bit about that next Sabbath. About that capacity to receive. But today I'm trying to set here something very straight. That we can have an understanding. That church, that Christians in, in, as individuals. And churches as collective Christians. We can pray for anything. But this need for the Holy Spirit is being emphasized in this passage. This parable is not about me being broke and needing money to make important purchases and turn that I turn to God in prayer. He may answer. This parable is not about me being sick and in need of relief. And I trust that God will grant that relief. He may answer. This parable is not about me turning to God about my son or daughter and asking him to make their lives right and asking him to guide them in the way they should go. There is enough place for that in the Bible. This parable is not about my mother my father being sick and asking God to send angels to protect them. There is place for that in the Bible. This parable is not about the church needing money to pay the mortgage or needing to keep the lights turning on turned on this parable is not about us having enough to give to the community in terms of physical resources there is a place in the bible for that this parable is about the need for the holy spirit to come into our lives when the holy spirit gets into our lives then we are able to be oriented to what god wants us in our sabbath school lesson Somebody said, he guides us into all truth. He convicts our hearts of sin. He brings our consciousness to the things which are righteousness. The Holy Ghost says there, it makes us stand up and hug each other and believe God has blessed us, holds us together. The Holy Spirit in our lives makes us understand. Jesus said, I want you to wait there. So the Holy Ghost will come upon you. When the Holy Ghost comes upon you, then you can have power to go out and take this message. If you do not have the Holy Ghost, the preacher can preach all he wants. The church is not going to be filled with the Holy Spirit and be blessed with the desire to go and do the work of God in the community. What we need is not more intelligence is not more resources what we need is the Holy Ghost to come upon us hover oh me Holy Spirit bed my trembling heart and brow fill me with thy hallowed presence Come, oh, come. Fill me now. You can fill me. Gracious Spirit, though I cannot tell thee how, but I need thee. 
greatly need thee. Come, oh, come, and fill me now. Brothers and sisters, he said, how much more? Whatever we have asked God for, almost invariably he grants the requests and so Jesus is saying how much more how much more I read this week where somebody said there are many people who are calling themselves Christians they have no particular need desire excuse me no particular desire to really be Christians and to do the work that God asks them to do on the earth. The life is a good life in some circles. It's nice to say I'm a Christian. And in some circles, it's good to be a Christian. Wednesday night we were talking about that. Sometimes the enemy loves the half-baked Christians in church because he can use them. They're not drunk and walking about, sir. We, we distance ourselves. They can be planted in the church. What we need is the Holy Spirit. Nothing to set before him. Of our own selves, we have nothing importunity goes to God and asks for something what importunity asks for is not for bread it's not really about the fish and the loaves it is for the Holy Spirit importunity has multiple operations you ask God for the Holy Spirit he's more eager to give that than he has been eager to give you anything else good as you can imagine a friend is God is infinitely infinitely superior in his goodness importunity asks God for the Holy Spirit and he's more eager to give that the Holy Spirit was the flame that burned in saints of old it settled on Abraham's brow and made him obedient to the point of sacrificing his only son it took Saul while on the road of Damascus and turned him into Paul with a heart seething with fire for the resurrected Lord it kept David up and picked him up from adultery and distress and planted his feet on the solid rock after he was taken out of the slime this this Holy Spirit made Job and Jew the time of death, destruction, and disease. It took Elijah from the cave of discouragement and depression and placed him on a fiery chariot and sent him all to glory. San Bernardino Community, Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Holy Spirit is hovering over us waiting for us to ask for him to come and settle within us he is truly ready to lift us up and fill our souls with fire oh for that flame of living fire shone so bright in saints of old which bid their hearts to heaven aspire. Come in distress and in danger bold. Where is that spirit, Lord? Which dwelt in Abraham's breast and seal him thine. Which made Paul's heart with sorrow melt and glow with energy divine. That spirit. That spirit which from age to age proclaimed thy love and taught thy ways, brightened thy Isaiah's vivid page and 
breathe in David hollow lays. It's not thy grace is mighty now, O God, as, as when Elijah felt his power, when glory beamed from Moses' brow, Job endured the trying hour. We need the Holy Ghost to come upon. And today I'm going to close with one prayer. I ask you to join me in. It's not a prayer for somebody who is sick. It's not a prayer for one of the traveling saints. It's not a prayer for extra money. There is a time for us to do those prayers. It's not a prayer yet for extra energy. Today I'm asking you to join with me in a prayer for the Holy Spirit in your private life. If you can stand to your feet with me, please. I'm just going to give a few moments for you to personally, just where you are, personally, just where you are, according to your own conviction. Ask God to give you that outpouring of the, his divine spirit. You've prayed for many things this week. But today I'm just asking you to, to pray for that Holy Spirit in your personal life. And then, and then I'm going to close. Just where you are. Just where you are. God of heaven, O oh God of heaven, in your holy word you, rev you have revealed the power of your spirit. And I know that what we need is the Holy Spirit because as I look at the church, the days of Pentecost, I remember reading how Jesus said, I want you to wait here for the Holy Spirit. In spite of that, somebody said, will you at this time restore your kingdom? He said, that's not our discussion now. It's not the wealth and the power of position. It's the Holy Spirit. And he said, wait. And he said, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I know, I know, their financial resources didn't change. They gathered together in a certain place. And they asked for the Holy Spirit. And according to Acts chapter 2, they called upon your name. It was the same church, the same frail, cussing, conniving human beings. A few days before, and then the Holy Ghost came upon them. I know your power. I notice your power. And when it came upon them, the same people were blessed with that divine power. Cloven tongues of fire came upon them. And they went out to do the work. Same people, same resources. 
The difference was the answer to the prayer for the Holy Spirit was realized. Oh God. And they were never the same thereafter. So I know you can do the same for us. I know you can do the same. So we ask you today to fill us with your divine spirit. That spirit will now orient our wills, our desires, our engagement in service according to your will. And you will thereafter empower us to do your work. God knows we need the Spirit. So God, answer us. Answer us today. Oh God, remember now the ancient days. Renew thy word. Thy grace restore. And while on thee our hearts we raise on us thy Holy Spirit pour in Jesus name Amen Amen